August 11th, 2020. Filthy Frank's Cake Trilogy, one of the last remnants of what many consider the golden era of YouTube, was wiped entirely from the platform. Hey guys, it's Filthy Frank! To the people that don't know, Filthy Frank, better known as Joji these days, was the home of edgy and absurd comedy on YouTube. At the peak of his popularity, Frank was making videos baking vomit cakes, getting ass tattoos, and granting make-a-wishes for young disabled. Stuff occurred by ass. But now with Frank receiving two community guideline strikes within a 90-day period, the termination of his channel may be way closer than we think. And there's one entity in the middle waiting to pull the trigger. You also have to not be a you're hiding your putrid, malformed chin. YouTube has updated their policies to prevent creator-on-creator -creator harassment. They were making a statement here. It wasn't even age-restricted. It was straight up removed from the platform. We care about creators. Creators are the heart of YouTube. Susan Wojcicki is the CEO of YouTube, and she has been in that position since 2014. And within that time frame of 2014 to now, YouTube has gone through many many changes, most notably being the shift to advertiser-friendly content and the enforcement of stricter content guidelines. Because of these recent changes under Wojcicki, Susan has been viewed in a very negative light within the community. There are many reasons as to why Susan Wojcicki is ruining YouTube, and in order to fully understand the situation, we have to travel all the way back to February of 2014, when Susan Wojcicki was named the CEO of YouTube. Prior to Susan's promotion to CEO, YouTube was run by Salar Kamengar, one of the first 10 employees of Google back when it was just a startup company. Under Salar, YouTube had a driven approach to online entertainment and that was to empower creators to not just share the media, but to become it. But it hasn't been until today with YouTube that everyday people actually are the media. You guys don't just watch news, you make news. You don't just flip through channels and complain there's nothing to watch, you create new ones some of which I think are going to become as well known in the future as networks like CNN, MTV, and ESPN. During his tenure, YouTubers began establishing themselves as brands that could compete with the viewership of traditional television, with the top creators easily pulling in millions of views per upload. YouTube became an attractive platform not just because of the numbers that they were pulling, but because of the idea that anyone can do it. Anyone can become famous, so to speak. But while Salar maintained the focus on YouTube, there was another employee at Google, and her name was Susan Wojcicki. Wojcicki came to Google in the same year as Salar, 1999, but her focus within the company was its branch of advertising. You may not be aware, but when it comes to advertising, Susan's pretty fucking good at it. Disregarding the abundance of today's sponsorships, YouTubers make money from AdSense. Basically, every time you see an ad on a video, that factors into AdSense and gets the creator paid. But AdSense isn't exclusive property to YouTube, as it is actually a Google creation. In 2010 alone, AdSense pulled in $28 billion in revenue. And guess who's the driving force behind all of it? Susan! <laughs> yes. Susan Wojcicki is credited as being the mastermind behind AdSense. She also is credited for being the driving force in Google's purchase of YouTube way back in 2006, which to her credit is an outstanding achievement. So what specifically happened with YouTube that made Susan in charge of Salar? By 2013, YouTube had over 1 million members in the YouTube Partner Program, 30 times that of the previous year. But despite the growth in monetizable content, advertising to pay these creators was failing. There was a lack of advertisers implementing their ads through YouTube's relatively new TrueView system. You know what they need more of? Advertisers. Because without more advertisers, all those people are going to starve. Every time you watch a YouTube video and there's an advertisement with the little skip button, that is through TrueView. And suggested ads are a part of TrueView as well. TrueView is YouTube's primary system for advertiser content that they still use to this day. But back in 2013, not only was TrueView new, but it was somewhat confusing as well. So when advertising was failing, Google had to make a decision. Well, they had such a powerful advertising mogul under their belt, so giving Susan the opportunity to take over in a desperate situation seemed like the route to take. And it worked. Not only did TrueView get refined, but YouTube became a platform that led in reaching more viewers than television, backed by capitalizing advertisers. This meant that a ton of revenue for the platform corresponded with the large viewership, which was a vast improvement over where Salar had left it. But the issue with Susan is that while yes, she should be applauded as a significant figure in advertising and revenue being as prominent as it is on the platform, the extreme methods that she has taken in order to maintain these advertisers is wrong and hurting the creators. And who better to explain it 
than Wojcicki herself. Over the past few years, creators have become noticeably frustrated in what seems to be censorship on YouTube. Any media distributor of content like YouTube is not responsible for any of the harmful content that may be posted on the site because of section 230 of law. We are in the distribution of news companies. Someone can upload a video and say their point of view about what happened with the news. So then why would YouTube be so worried about removing content that they do view as harmful? because that's protected too. Under the same section 230, YouTube can act in the faith of a Good Samaritan. So there's a Good Samaritan clause that actually enables us to remove content that is legal under US law, like mature content, adult content, hate content. So it actually gives us protections for that. And remove content that they view as filthy, yeah. excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. But now content that was completely acceptable just a few years ago at the time of its creation is now being deemed violations of current day rules. So let's look over the most notable videos taken down to these enforcements. TV Filthy Frank, Vomit Cake, Hair Cake, Human Cake. Filthy Frank's Vomit Cake was taken down on November 7th, 2019, and the sequels were removed nearly a year later. These videos were determined as a violation of YouTube's content guidelines regarding violent or graphic content, with the obvious graphic content being the vomiting and its consumption as a cake. Now, the current day community guidelines clearly state that the showing of bodily fluids like vomit to shock or disgust viewers is against the rules. However, at the time Vomit Cake was created, it violated none of the guidelines. As YouTube used to emphasize the importance of context, the YouTube community guidelines back in 2015 said that if a video is particularly graphic or disturbing, it should be balanced with additional context and information. And one can make the argument that Filthy Frank's content for the Cake series was not just vomit for shock value, but the context of it was comedy. There's a difference between uploading a video just vomiting the whole time versus a produced sketch that incorporates vomit as a part of the story and entertainment. It looks like you have, you have cancer or something, I dubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yo, yo, I gotta check this shit out. Oh, I'll, I'll, ch I'll check it out in a second. One, Dude, what the f minute, guys. Yo, it's fine. Dude, just come check it out. What the Each cake video had a type of story going on that used the cake for its intended purpose, and that wasn't just the shock value. It was for the entertainment of the sketch and the story being told. But of course, YouTube likes to change its guidelines and apply rules that never existed to past content. Well then, okay, YouTube. So there's this old video of a guy drinking Epicac, very viral video back in the day, causing him to projectile vomit all over the sidewalk and eventually lick it up on the floor. No age restriction, millions of views, not affected by YouTube. Popular reactions to the video, like the one by the Fine Brothers, is also available with no issue whatsoever. But what if I told you this same guy went on Jerry Springer and vomited on people in front of crowds to shock them and that those videos are completely available to view? You know, there's a video of him on stage eight years ago vomiting over some random fans. Disgusting content on YouTube? I guess it only applies to some creators. The slow-mo guys, who are on YouTube's good side by the way, can make a video showing slow motion vomiting, which is pretty disgusting in my opinion as a viewer. And the tags of the video label it as disgusting and gross. But how does YouTube treat it? Age restricted. But Filthy Frank? Deleted. Another video with 500,000 views that has a guy eating, vomiting, and eating the vomit is not age restricted even with the title stating graphic content. And the tags being disgusting, gross, and vomit. Another video called Banana and Sprite Challenge is literally just people sitting in a circle and vomiting and is still completely available to watch on YouTube even with the label Vomit Alert in the title. Something isn't adding up here. Content Cop Leafy One of the most viewed commentary videos of all time was taken down for harassment and bullying. Yes, a video criticizing Leafy is here was taken down for harassment and bullying. For a bit of context, Idubs made his content cop on Leafy is here, calling out his bad content and making fun of his bullying of other people's appearance. He shouldn't have to bully people looking the way he does. So I decided that I'd raise funds for a chin implant. To satirize how Leafy picks on people for their appearance, Idubs made fun of Leafy's chin. But apparently YouTube thinks that this is bullying, even though once again these rules were not the same back then, and this video was satirizing the actions of the person he was criticizing. If that logic applies to this video and gets it removed, then why wouldn't the same happen to a channel like Leafy, whose whole career was bullying on vulnerable people, including kids too. You know, minors, minors the huge importance of protection on YouTube right now. All of Leafy 
Beefy's videos making fun of the appearance of kids are still readily available on YouTube, but for some reason YouTube took down the one video that was satirizing the content that was considered problematic. At the time of this recording, Leafy's channel actually got terminated. Say what you will about Leafy, I still think his termination is setting a bad precedent for YouTube going forward. And I'll explain why. The reason why I thought Leafy got terminated was because of spam and clickbait. Because he has a history of doing that, and his recent 10 Pokemon videos, only like 3 of them actually talked about Pokemon. The rest were about like some random topic. But from what it looks like, Leafy got terminated for harassment and bullying, and I'm assuming it's from these recent Pokemon videos. The thing about Leafy's videos regarding Pokemon, those videos were criticism. He did poke fun at her appearance, but the worst thing he said was, Pokemon isn't even attractive. There's really no other way of saying it, she's just not hot, dude. That's not bullying, it's just his opinion. Either way, this situation is fucked because I'm against both ideas. One of them being that he was harassing Pokemon, which is not true. I don't think he was harassing Pokemon, he was criticizing her for actions that she has apologized for. And two, Leafy did actually break these guidelines for years on end. The YouTube guidelines on bullying back in 2016 were still against how Leafy went about making his videos, where it was like the lowest form of just picking on someone because they were ugly or something like that. So while yes, it is accurate that they're terminating him for breaking rules for so many years, the problem is that this precedent is going to be applied to other creators going forward who are clearly satiric. Like, I'm afraid iDubbbz is going to get taken down for bullying Tana Mojo, Ricegum, and all of those people. It's a very scary time right now. Psychic Pebbles, Fine Bros React. This animation was legitimate satire used to criticize the ridiculous lengths the Fine Bros go to make reactions out of everything. We've done kids react, teens react, elders react, YouTubers react, cause survivors react, syndromers react, babies react, and child molesters react. What else can we do? We need more ideas. And this criticism came at a time where the fine bros were capitalizing on tragedies like school and Psychic Pebbles' video was not a threat or intimidation to bully. It was actually the textbook definition of satire. Satire does not equate to bullying or harassment like YouTube thinks. The point of satire is to poke fun at something with an underlying intention. Psychic Pebbles' satiric intention was very clear. To criticize the fine bros for trying to profit off of relevant tragedies and milking out the react genre. This video was age-restricted for years until it was unfairly taken down on December 11, 2019, and it was not harassment or bullying by any stretch. Gokunaru, the death of H3HD Productions. Gokunaru's nearly two hour criticism of H3HD Productions was not harassment or bullying. It was a well-constructed video that pretty clearly criticized the actions of Ethan Klein. Only because I'm afraid he's gonna try to kill somebody, but I also don't trust him with the address. I think he would like post it on Twitter immediately. So thank you, Ethan, for putting an alcoholic on blast. Sending him on an emotional roller coaster. You're you're doing the Lord's work, man. Papa, Papa bless. This wasn't like the Idubs video. It was a cut and dry analysis on the wrongdoings of H3H3. But after its initial takedown, more information came out stating that it was against the simulated violence policy on YouTube. In principle, this is an accurate enforcement. The video did go against violence guidelines on YouTube because of its implications that he would murder H3H3. Yet, there are videos of legitimate murder that are available to watch on YouTube, and these videos can be found on the Live Leak channel. These are channels that show actual violence, not implied like Gokunaru, actual violence, and they get the respect to at least be age restricted and not nuked entirely without reason. So when YouTube says that they enables us to remove content that is legal under US law, like mature content, adult content, hate content. Clearly what they consider hateful or harmful is subjective, and it's this inconsistent enforcement that is killing a large genre of content on this site. We're a site where we give everybody a voice. But that is false. When you actively remove content that actually doesn't violate your policy, yet show favoritism to others, that is not giving everyone a voice. YouTube. This seems like it was a targeted removal of content from creators you do not like. You cannot apply these actions and delete history from the site. Why are you trying to police internet history when the standards you hold now don't add up to what they were before? The point of YouTube content change is to show growth, and deletion is blatant censorship. Like a lot of those old videos on that main <laughs> channel were like, this isn't what we accept for guidelines now, even though it was posted fucking five years ago. Yeah. Like we're going to remove it or we're going to do this to it, blah, blah, blah. And that started happening like all across the board. And a lot of the time it's not about uh, making money off it. It's more about the visibility. And if you're going to get views off something like that, yeah. 
It's yeah, like yeah, you're yeah, just 100%. making it in like a a closed room for certain specific people that are going to see it. How can we trust that the content we are making right now will hold up to the guidelines in five years? When as we've seen, the guidelines are inconsistently enforced and constantly changing. Is a Cody Co video roasting religious people going to be deemed as hate speech in five years? Well, YouTube will decide that. Fuck you, Susan! You piece of shit! The top five stars all come from YouTube. They don't come from Hollywood. They come from YouTube. So then why is YouTube prioritizing celebrities over YouTube? MatPat of the Game Theorists had a chance to interview Susan on creator issues affecting the community. Speaking of things that directly affect our monetization and our yes. businesses, I see you looking at the clock hoping that this ticket. No! But one interesting point that MatPat brought up was that celebrities seem to get preferential treatment by YouTube. The verification button it doesn't exist for creators, but does exist for celebrities. You know, there's all these massive changes. It, it exists for everybody in the same way. Uh, sure. Okay. Okay. According to YouTube, the verification check mark is not available for people until they reach 100k subscribers, have authentication of their channel, and an active channel at that. This was actually a change that was announced in September of 2019, and many creators who didn't fall into the new standards lost verification if they had had it. Did like I think and I don't know why they did this. There's been a lot of backlash from creators. And the criteria is kind of vague. It's like, in order to get verified, you need to have built a large audience and community on YouTube. What does that mean? Like, a, a big audience? How big? It's just kind of weird. I don't know. It's another string of stuff that people hate, I guess, that YouTube's doing. Once again, YouTube enforced new rules that hurt those who followed them prior. If, like, uh, Billie Eilish comes onto the platform without 100,000 subscribers, she's not going to get a check mark until she gets 100,000 subscribers. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that true? Um, we'll have to let it's, me have to look into it. But I, I think, I think, let, let's like talk about a politician, right? Because we have yeah. politicians who are coming yes, on on our platform, okay? And election integrity is something that we're working in incredibly yep. hard on. So you have a politician who comes on. You don't want to have. We have to be able to give them a check mark. Wow, Susan. You really just dodged the question there. Yes, it is true that a politician would need some type of verification because they can easily be misrepresented by opposing parties. But Billie Eilish is not a politician, and she would definitely get verified long before that 100k mark. Here's why. Take a look at Brie Larson, a celebrity who recently made the shift to YouTube by posting her first upload on July 2nd, 2020. As of now, she's verified and has over 300,000 subscribers, but she got verified a lot earlier than you think. With the use of the Wayback Archive, I found that at just 102 subscribers, Brie Larson was verified on YouTube, with her first and only video at the time. Now she doesn't fit the 100k requirement, which means that she shouldn't have been able to apply for verification. And even if she was able to, I doubt any creator with just one video would get verified. It, it exists for everybody in the same way. So YouTube is flat out lying. This policy does enforce preferential treatment because as we just saw, someone who has the resources of being a Hollywood celebrity can just come to YouTube and have the policy favor them over an actual creator. Same thing goes for Matisse Thibel, an NBA player who just recently got verified under 100,000 subscribers. But then I came across a particular channel by the name of Taylor Stevens. Now, Taylor Stevens is not a celebrity by any means. I couldn't find him anywhere besides YouTube. However, he also has a verification check mark right next to his name, but only 6,000 subscribers. Now, I was curious on whether he got his verification before the guidelines had changed, and YouTube once again exposed itself. Through the archives, I found that Taylor's channel, while experiencing a subgrowth, had not been verified as late as February of 2020, meaning the verification he currently has would not make sense because it does not meet the current guidelines and he was not verified prior to them being enforced. But do you know why he experienced this sudden jump in subscribers? Turns out, if you look in his about page, he's an editor for Jablinski Games. 
Jack Black's YouTube channel. Jack Black did not channel box Taylor until what seems to be late 2019, and because of this, Taylor began to get a sub boost from being featured. As he accumulated more subscribers, YouTube decided to verify him, even though he did not meet the guidelines every other creator has to follow. Once again, showing that they not only lied, it, well. it exists for everybody in the same way, but are giving preferential treatment to creators who are connected with celebrities. Some general examples of unfair treatment and double standards on YouTube is in a situation like Raka Raka, a channel known for their violent, high produced, and edited short films that are treated to being demonetized and removed from the search engine. Have a look at this. This is our page where we do skits. And look how much has yellow and red. 70, 80% of the videos. Our videos, if you see the original skits, they take months to make. We literally put blood, sweat, and tears into the videos. But when big budget YouTube TV does the exact same thing, the policies don't apply anymore. Anymore. This show breaks every single rule that YouTube gave us. Everything that YouTube told us personally was wrong with our videos is in this show. You've forbidden us from making mature content and then fund an entire multi-million dollar show making that sort of content. I'm not hating on The Wayne Show. I think it's an awesome show. I just don't understand how YouTube can make that show after the rules that they've applied to everyone else. We have a video completely restricted and hidden because someone bites off someone's nose. In this first episode, which anyone can watch, he bites off someone's nose. What they're gonna say is, it's context. It's all in context. That's what YouTube tells us. It's in context. It's gonna be for a narrative. Believe it or not, our videos have narrative as well. There's a video of Juice World and Susan Wojcicki talking about manipulating promotion and getting him more viewership. <laughs> Treatment of videos with nudity and sexual content are not consistent at all. I understand that content involving nudity or sexuality for educational purpose and not for sexual gratification is allowed. But there are rule breakers. Breastfeeding channels like Tasha Mama have promoted links to sexual content and pornography in their descriptions under the guise of their videos being education. And that channel, while being suspended at one point, has been back on YouTube with none of their original videos being deleted. Creator like Belle Delphine making sexually provocative content and using YouTube to promote borderline porn content on her OnlyFans is only age restricted and not removed from the platform. But of course, other creators don't even get the privilege of an age restriction. Both of these instances are against community guidelines when it comes to promoting links to sexual content. This type of content should not be allowed according to YouTube. And then a music video like Cardi B's WAP that is fully sexual content, not for the purpose of education, is both monetized and not age restricted because it is considered art. If we can differentiate corporations with the context of art, why can't we do the same for creators? Demonetization. It's a YouTube rant and I haven't even discussed that yet. Every YouTuber has thrown the word demonetized or demonetization around at some point. On YouTube, the ability to profit off of your content is literally just based on an icon. If it's green, then you've survived. To those who haven't, it's back to the drawing board. But reflecting on what you did in order to get demonetized would be easier if we were actually given an explanation on how it actually works. We want to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. We just need to know what those rules are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been one of the areas that YouTube has been falling down on. But the problem is that the information we creators get isn't in line with the reality of the situation. Sure, YouTube does tell you that if you don't do anything like this, then money is all yours. While YouTube classifies us as either monetizable or demonetized, advertisers are treated a bit differently. If you're running an ad campaign and you want to limit your ad to play on videos that are rated G or T or M, you can simply click a tab that, well, abracadabra. If you still had any doubt, there's your video ratings. This tool would not work and it would not be structured this way if videos were not being rated internally. This is some good information for creators to know because it specifies the type of content that you are making and how YouTube categorizes your videos. But YouTubers have no access to this information. You can make slightly vulgar content that is not complete insanity, but YouTube can classify you as mature. 
and you would have no way of finding out. Why can't you just put TV MA on our content? Why can't it be YouTube MA or YouTube 15? Three quarters of the videos that use age restrict to 18 plus is suitable for 13 plus. According to a recent study by Sprout Social, users who are ages 13 to 17 make up 85% of the viewers and 18 to 29 make up 91%. That means that a large majority of the content doesn't have to be catered to family-friendly content above all. There's a kids app for that. So if you have a rating system, enforce it properly. That would make the quality of the content not degrade. The advertisers get to place their ads on content that fits their demographic, and YouTubers can profit off of content that fits their listed demographic. When you spend so much time, sometimes money, creating content and uploading it, there isn't a specific reason as to why it was demonetized. And when you file a review, if it doesn't meet standards, you get a generic response with no explanation. And if it does, you're not told why it was flagged in the first place. We act on behalf of our advertisers. If you don't make us money, you don't matter. We care about creators. Creators are the heart of YouTube. From what I've shown you through this documentary, YouTube's message doesn't lie with their actions. They've blatantly violated their own policies while giving everyone the illusion of an equal platform. So where do we go from here? Because I wouldn't have made this video without proposing ideas that could maybe steer the platform in the right direction that I want YouTube to hear. Be more honest with your policies regarding content that is monetized. You have the rating system that advertisers can use. Give the people who make the content the ability to know where they stand within the system. The mainstream media has always had a hatred towards YouTube because they never understood the platform. When it started, they didn't take us seriously. When it became bigger than any media outlet, they envied us. The mainstream media will do whatever it takes to tarnish the reputation of YouTube. YouTube has to realize that when they determine these media outlets as authoritative content, they give power to them to censor the platform. Just because these are huge names, the reputation of the media is not always consistent as they sensationalize news and manipulate the facts in order to steer an agenda. And they've done the same to YouTube by sensationalizing it as a home for hateful and violent content. They're trying trying to curb harmful speech on their site. Hateful speech. YouTube has to grow a pair of fucking nuts and realize that the media does not give a shit about YouTube as a platform and if there's hateful or violent content. They only care to tarnish the name of YouTube because it threatens their reach as a media distributor. YouTube is the biggest distributor of content on the internet and the media is threatened by that. But from what we've seen, mass online outrage is temporary. Advertisers don't give a shit where they post their products on. It's only when people get mad and call them out on it they have to boycott temporarily. But these boycotts don't last. They always wind up coming back because the dollar is what matters at the end of the day. Susan, I'm not calling for you to be fired, okay? I don't think firing someone's going to change YouTube. You have made YouTube as profitable as it has ever been. You've avoided many adpocalypses from getting out of hand. But I'm saying that you cannot deny that the way you've been treating the platform to succumb to the false pressure of political correctness, YouTube is no longer for everyone. With so many unwritten rules, lack of communication, and content being deemed inappropriate from different eras, lies of favoritism and hypocritical practices, YouTube has to be honest with us. This is YouTube. Not all creators welcome.